Um, so our last speaker today is Daniel Huck. Uh, he, <coughs> uh, he received his uh, PhD at Imperial College in, uh, in London uh, around 2003. And he is a visiting researcher at the Center for Complexity Science at Imperial College in London, a visiting professor at the Department of Physics at Washington University in St. Louis, and he's a member of the ORCID board uh, and he's a fellow of the Institute of Physics. Uh, he is also the CEO of Digital Science, and he has been involved in research management, research policy, open access, and the development of responsible metrics for more than the last 15 years. And today he will tell us about the constructive research, uh, a potential future for scientific communication. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the uh, invitation to be here. Um, it actually feels a little bit like coming home, having grown up in a physics department, and even having done research into theoretical quantum optics, this, uh, this feels very much uh, the right place to be. Uh, so what I wanted to give you, we've talked a lot about today about uh, the history of research communication and a little bit about some of the initiatives that are trying to bring open access more to life. What I wanted to think about a little bit here in this session is uh, the future of research communication and how the road that we're on uh, might get us somewhere quite interesting. But I want to start by uh, asking you to look at this uh, white block with black blocks on it. Um, it well, exactly. You see, uh, a lot of our intuition is uh, built around uh, the experience that we have of scientific publication. The uh, infrastructure done well is invisible. If you look at this white block with uh, black blocks on it, you know where the title is, you know where the co-authors are, you know where the page is, you know where the date is, you can tell where the text starts, you know where the abstract is, you can tell where the affiliations are, you can probably give a good guess of where the DOI is, and you can indeed guess where the publication actually comes from. And for a physics audience, as you probably got that entirely correct. So the interesting thing is that we have this, uh, this relationship with papers in particular, this kind of PDF, paper-based form, uh, and the electronic version of that has become very like the original paper-based thing that we have this relationship with. And part of it's because it has this very strong um, cognate uh, resonance with us. We know what this looks like. We know how to interact with it. And breaking that is really challenging. And we do need to break it if we're going to move forward and actually do different types of research publication and get publication in place that's fit for the type of research that we're now doing. This is really trusted as well. This is another thing that's, uh, that exists in the space. It's this trust that we have around certain journals because they have certain impact factors. I am not a big fan of impact factor. I'm not a big fan of journal-based metrics. Technically, I'm not actually even a big fan of citations, though it's something that I know we all crave and need for professional advancement. So, in fact, these things are very challenging to work with, given that they're very established in our psyche. If we think about uh, a publication, then there are a variety of passive forms of trust that we evolve as a result of our relationship with publications. First of all, we think about the journal that they exist in, then we think about the people who publish those papers and uh, where the work was done. We worry about um, who funded the publication. All of these different aspects build for us a kind of trust framework which is passive. This is what exists around the paper. But there are also more active uh, types of trust that are being created with journals and with papers. First of all, we have paper-to-paper -paper citations. Obviously, if something is getting highly cited, getting a lot of attention, you don't know that it's good quality, but you know that people are reading it and thinking about it. More, frequent, more recently, we start thinking about actually tweets. People start tweeting about papers and talking about the fact that they uh, exist. We start thinking about clinical trials in medical settings. Uh, we start thinking about patents, people who are actually generating income from papers. And then we also think about other forms of output, like policy documents and things where we're at, our research is being used to inform policy. So we have a kind of passive world of trust and an active world of trust that are coming together to give us a lot of uh, background to 
um, to these papers. And so context is very important to us as individuals. And in thinking going forwards, what will research publication be like in the future? We need to think about the types of trust that we need to engender in order to put ourselves in the right places to be able to benefit from it. My company, Digital Science, put together a new database over the last four years. Uh, it's called Dimensions. It's freely available. There's a subscription version to be up front, but there's a freely available version on the web that you can go to. And we give you lots of context around papers. This is effectively a free version of Web of Science, a free version of Scopus, and you can find out not only about research papers, but also about the policy documents that cite them, the patents that cite them, the clinical trials that derive from them. And all of that information starts to give you a different view on trust than you get from standard citation networks and standard reliance and impact factors. You'll notice, however, that we are uh, going over thin ice in some of the areas. The bits that we haven't been able to link are fairly significant. One of the bits is here. The whole of research is something that we don't want to measure actively. We think that measurement is quite a dangerous thing, something you need to use quite carefully. And so if you are going to use it, then it's something that you need to understand deeply. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is actually not actively measure research itself. Everything that we're going around research, these are things that exist in the market anyway. But actually going into the research process itself and trying to measure that in any meaningful way, we consider to be quite dangerous. There are bad things that happen when you start looking inside the research process in a very public way. This uh, happened in research uh, in um, ClimateGate in the UK. Uh, some researchers uh, had their emails published publicly. And of course, they were unsure about certain aspects of the research. Of course, as you would be while you're doing research. You're not sure. You're working stuff out. And for that public, public um, discourse to happen in that public way, when it should have been a private discourse, actually significantly damaged science, parts of science in the UK for a significant period of time. Public Trust in science is something that we all need. Uh, someone else spoke very eloquently on the funding requirements that we have as public organisations. And in fact, if we lose that trust with the people who are funding us, then why should they continue to fund us? So there are some very tricky aspects of how research publications are uh, put into the world and how we measure them and how open we are about some of the processes that we have internally. Another aspect of uh, public relations which is challenging is actually um, the popular scientist, the uh, science programmes that you see on television. There have been a number of sociological studies done now which show, in fact, that when people are exposed to popular science, they actually value science less, not more. They think that having watched the television programme, they are now expert. They don't need the rest of us to find anything more out for them. They understand it completely. I actually don't think that this is a problem with science communication in and of itself, but how it's done. We're dumbing things down too far. We're, living, we're um, making things too simple. We're reducing too far because we want to get the audience involved with us. And in getting the audience involved with us, we bring them too close to a, um, a superficial understanding of the problem. So there are some challenges, there are some big challenges around all of this. But what I want to think about a little bit more today is how we start decomposing that publication that we started off with. How do we actually think about that in a modern environment? Because I think we're at the stage now where breaking away from the PDF is overdue. If we think about the mobile phone that we have in our pockets, and this may not be applicable to everybody in the audience, but those of us with a less theoretical bent, uh, you can go out with your mobile phone, you can snap pictures. This mobile phone is amazingly aware of its surroundings. If I go and take a picture with my mobile phone, I can then download an app and I can look at the location that I was at when I took the picture. It'll give me the aperture size, the speed of the shutter on the camera. It will tell me all sorts of things about what happened around my piece of equipment. But in fact, lab equipment typically doesn't, it is not self-aware at the level of its surroundings. It doesn't tell us who logged into it when the experimental run was done. 
It doesn't actually tell us about you know, the local magnetic field strength. It doesn't tell us about what the air pressure is in the lab necessarily. And actually, if we want to go to a fully um, transparent and auditable, reproducible research system, which is, I think, where we need to go, then our lab equipment needs to start being much smarter than it is. It needs to be much more like a smartphone. When we actually publish that type of work in a journal, the data set that we publish is focused on the results, but not the context of the results. In this particular journal, you see a fairly flat representation of the computer analysis that's gone on. In this case, um, the Royal Society works with us, and all of the data behind this article is on Figshare. But that's still only two layers. It's still very flat. Let's take a simple example. This is an analysis that I did using our search engine earlier last year. What I did was I took all my papers, I took all of the citations to my papers, I then took all the institutions associated with those citations, and I plotted them on a graph. And you'll notice that where I gave part of this talk, first of all in the world, it was University of Sydney. Australia does not like my research. So that's life. Uh, I brook disappointment easily. But behind that actually is not just the data that I use to create that, but also the code that I use to do the parsing of the data. So I have a full backup of everything that's happened to that data set as I iterated the data set to get the data right, as I iterated the code to make sure the analysis was right. All of that is stored and available. And so behind my picture, I want to be able to kind of double click on the picture and get to the layer behind it. And then actually I want to click on the layer behind that and see the experimental design. How did I conceptualize the experiment? What was my thinking? So I want to add a layer behind that. I then want to add a further layer. I want to add the ethics environment around all the things that I'm doing so that I end up with a variety of layers telling me about the context of the data that I'm actually working on. In this context, this is part of why we came up with Dimensions and Search Engine as a product. Because we know that in the next few years, we aren't going to be searching for papers anymore. We're going to be searching for research objects, outputs that exist free of a paper in and of themselves. And I think in going forwards, we've had some really interesting ways of publishing, but it's still around the paper. And all of the mechanisms that people are thinking about, both in SciPost and Quantum, I think are equally applicable to the new world where we publish research objects rather than papers. In some sense, a paper is just a conglomeration of these kind of bubbles of research object. Um, if we think about a paper, it's effectively a narrative statement that links a number of different research objects together. So you might have a set of research objects which contextualise your research. You might have the research object that you've created as part of your work. And then you have uh, other different pieces of the pie that you're bringing in to justify your research. So effectively, we're talking about relationships between different research objects. At digital science, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can actually tool this up so that uh, people can actually benefit from this and use it in interesting ways. Uh, for full disclosure, we are a for-profit company, but we are an unprofitable company, which is different. Uh, <coughs> Yes, we're making significant losses, so, so you should all feel very, very comfortable with this level of talk. Um, this is a first stage. I have a number of different conceptualizations for how I think about papers, but this is a first stage in how I think about papers. Essentially, I have research objects in the system, and you can see here a number of different technologies which exist in the digital science portfolio which help us think about how to version a paper in a different way. If you look at the Gigantum strand, this is effectively syncing data sets and code together so that they can iterate with time. I don't think of a paper as being published on a particular date. Rather, I think of it as iterating with time. And in fact, that as you improve your research object, as you improve the data set that you have available, it may go out of sync with your narrative. And so we need mechanisms that say to you, your narrative is not in sync with your paper. You actually need now to update your, your explanation of this research object. 
And there are a number of other different things here. We talked a little bit, I won't go through all of this because of time, but we talked a little bit about review today. We did an experiment last year called peer review in the blockchain. We tried looking at trying to, uh, getting publishers to uh, bring their peer reviews onto a blockchain environment so we could get peer review to be shared more easily as a first step in the process. So that was uh, slightly challenging, I have to say. Um, from a legal perspective, actually getting people to part with copyright is non-trivial, as many people in the room will know. Um, we also have this environment of other tools around all of this that we've been investing in and developing over the years, which give you different aspects of how to consume these articles, how to measure the interest in the articles, how to put more unique identifiers into articles. Without a unique identifier framework, there's so much data that we're losing about the research that's been done, and we need to add that back into the system. So our conceptualization for the research of the future is very much that it's like software. We think that research articles in the future will become iterative. We think that there will be fewer publications, but more iterations on publications. We think that we will essentially publish research objects, and in fact that the authorship of a research object with time will change. You'll have different authors associated with different versions. And so Publication of the future, we think, looks very much like this. It's basically a sea of all of those research objects that I uh, talked about. And your way of consuming it is essentially to ask your AI every morning to say to you, please write me a review article relating these five research objects. By the time you get into the office, that's been written, you read it, and then you start your original thinking from that basis that's been created for you. Just one closing note, I wrote a report earlier in the year called The Ascent of Open Access. It covers some of the points that other speakers have uh, worked on today, and it also has some nice data that you can play with and uh, download and uh, enjoy. So with that, thank you very much. Oh. Okay, so now we will have uh, yeah, an hour break, 25 minutes, until 18.20. Uh, there will be coffee and uh, beer and wine provided outside. And we meet here again at 18.20. Yeah, and let's thank once more time the speakers of... Thank you.